Good afternoon, I'm Tommy Humphreys for Kitco and Cambridge House. Joining me is Keith Schaefer, editor of the Oil and Gas Investment Bulletin. Thanks very much for being here, Keith. Tommy, thanks for having doing? me. Good, good. Uh, yeah, like I said, thanks for being here. So, seems like the U.S. is swimming in oil discoveries. Why are prices at the pump so high? Right, I, I, I think that's a, a, a big misconception that retail investors have, and even consumers, in that it's not just about driving gasoline. When we have all this oil in North America, which is so cheap compared to the rest of the world, like WTI prices are $15 a barrel lower than Brent prices, and Brent being the major international oil price. So our refineries here in North America, they make lots of different products, and driving gasoline is just one of them. So they make uh, this- Vaseline. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, they dropped. <laughs> they make uh, not just driving gasoline, but like diesel fuel, uh, jet fuel, home heating oil, and all that stuff gets exported all around the world. And the world is hungry for our exports because we're cheaper than everybody else. So all of a sudden what you're seeing is these refineries in North America, yes, they make driving gasoline, but they make all these other industrial fuels that are called distillates that really fuel and transport the world, uh, and then they export them. So they get to basically buy WTI, sell Brent, and they don't just make driving gasoline. They make all these other products, and they're trying to make more of those products and less driving gasoline because it makes more money. So even though we're swimming in crude, you can say we've got an ocean of crude, but we've got a desert of refined products because of the huge exports that we're making overseas. So that's why our gas prices are basically 50% higher than what they were four years ago compared to the price of oil. Like we're paying the same price at the pump now at 90 bucks oil as what we paid four years ago in 2008 when oil was like 130, $140. Wow, so tell me, what do you think about natural gas? Seems like prices are, are, are low just based on the last sort of 10 year chart, but, but obviously there's an abundance of new supply. Where do you think the nat natural gas picture is going? Yeah. The, the fundamentals on natural gas tell me that gas is going to stay low for a while. You know, even though you've got most of the basins in the United States actually declining in production, the big granddaddy of them all, the Marcellus Shale, is just ramping up and there's like a thousand wells there ready to come on stream. Up here in Canada, you've got the Big Horn River Basin ready to come on stream that's now sitting idle in northern British Columbia. So I would say if gas gets above 350, you're gonna see a huge drop in demand as all the industrial power producers, the electricity generators, switch from gas to coal. So you've got all this new supply ready to come on stream at higher prices. You've got all this demand ready to go offline at higher prices. So it's really hard for me to see gas going over 350 and MCF, and today it's just over three. How high are the decline rates on these new discoveries? Like, how long is this gonna last? When do you think there will be a... a you know, a, a, a chance to make some money in, in playing gas. Uh, in, in, in playing the producer side of gas, you know, it, it could be a long time. Like, like I say, the Marcellus hasn't peaked in production yet, and that could be two to three or even four years away, potentially. And because it's so large, it can make up for a lot of the other plays. And as I said, the Horn River, the Montney formation in Canada is also just really ramping up hard. So it could be two or three years. But you're right about the declines. These declines, these wells decline their production so hard, like 65 to 90 percent in year one. So it could happen that these wells deplete way quicker than what everybody thinks. And then we'd be back to quite a bullish situation in gas. And there's really only one formation that we've had producing long enough to know that, the Barnett in Texas, the very first one. All these other shale plays are still pretty young, and it could happen that they deplete way faster than we expect but right now the market's not pricing that in. So where's the money to be made then? I, I mean, maybe you want to talk a bit about technology or the service companies, like how does an investor make money in this space? Well, in, in natural gas, you don't make money with the producers. Like in, in Canada, there's been five or six stocks that are the leading natural gas stocks that have had a nice pop, but all the rest of them are still trading quite poorly. And I just don't see the potential for them to go a lot higher. But uh, in the overall, Oil patch, I, I think the place to be is, uh, I think the refineries on the big caps are going to do really, really well for the next two or three years because of what I just talked about, buying WTI, selling Brent. On the small caps, uh, these junior energy producers, even at the bottom of the trough when oil is trading at $80, are, is making great money. So you buy some of these fast-growing junior producers when oil is at the bottom of this trough in 80 to $85 range, 
you should make money. Interesting. Okay, so I can remember a few names. I can probably think of four, but certainly D3 and Poseidon and a couple others have been phenomenal wins for your subscribers, and you were the first person to shine a light on them. Can you tell me a little bit of the genesis of what you do? How do you run the Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin? Sure, sure. So uh, th those two plays are, are, are good examples of kind of how I do my thing, where uh, D3 had a big position in a new play called the Alberta Bakken. And when the play first got hot, we all kind of got excited about it, and then it didn't pan out. So everybody left the stock alone. But then I, I never sold any of that stock, I just kept following it because I knew they were still going to have big growth even without that play. So, but then in January this year, they announced, hey, we've cracked the geological code, and this is, we're getting 300 barrels a day. And so I told all my subscribers, well, let's go back to this story. If, if they have such a big land position here, that is just if they've really done this, we're going to make a lot of money with this stock. And so then the next set of wells was 600 barrels a day. The next set of wells were 900 barrels a day. So we got lucky with that one. We jumped on it very quickly, got ahead of the analysts, and said, stay long and be strong. Poseidon was a story where it was just fantastic cash flow. Like, uh, long before they, were, they spun it out of the natural gas story that it used to belong to called Open Range, we jumped on the story at five bucks after it had just doubled from 250, so it was not an easy chart to buy, but the cash flow generation was so strong and the growth was so phenomenal, it just said, you know, we have to play. And then, of course, when they announced the big spin out, the stock doubled on that news. They created a dividend uh, company that paid a dividend, so, and we actually bought the stock even at higher prices, and just because that team knows what they're doing and have been able to keep up the growth and so we've stayed with the story for a long time. And made, and made even more money. So tell me, like, how do you find ideas? So what's your process? Well, uh, you live in the business, obviously. Yeah, we live in the business. So we get a lot of research in every day. So I'm reading research reports morning, noon and night, trying to figure out who's got the big land positions, who's raising the money, who's had the big discoveries, and, and just trying to figure out where the, the catalysts are and what, what could surprise the market. The, the other game that we play is you know the analysts they'll only give incremental price targets but I can look at a play and say wow like with D3 all the analysts when the stock was 250 they were saying oh this could be four dollars and I was saying four dollars if these two plays keep working the way we think it is this is a ten dollar stock this year like so we can leapfrog where the analysts are maybe too conservative for fear of looking silly for putting a, a signal right. they solar. can't jump outside the herd I well, can jump outside there. As a subscriber, I personally appreciate this, you know, the simple way that you communicate all this stuff. And uh, I'm just curious, am, am I your typical subscriber? Who is your, your profile subscriber? Uh, I would suggest that my subscribers fall into two categories. By far the largest component would be uh, retired investors with a little bit extra money who want to play the pennies for a little juice. Now, not all my stock picks are penny stocks. I've put, you know, billion dollar companies in the portfolio before. But by and large, they're the smaller, more leveraged companies, and so the, the, the retired guys who want to play a little bit extra. And, and honestly, the, the other 5-10% of my book is uh, stockbrokers who don't trust their own analysts. The professionals. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the professionals who want a, a bit of an independent second opinion besides what their analyst is telling them. And how, do, uh, how, do, uh, how does this audience stay up with you? Where do you, where do you go to subscribe? Uh, I, I, at my website at oilandgas-investments.com, so that's really... It's all online. We don't do any hard mail, so that's the only place you can figure it out. Twitter.com slash oil and gas dash invest, I believe, too. Yeah, Twitter. Follow and yeah. Great to have you here, Keith. Thanks, Thanks. very much, man. Thanks, Tommy. God bless. Cheers.